we are to the parable of the weeds. And as I was reading and thinking about this scripture today, I thought, I know there's some folks out there who like old westerns, right? Anybody out there like old westerns? Yeah, of course. Yeehaw. All right. There may even be a few hats in the service today. And uh, what what is the main way in the old westerns that you could tell the difference between a good guy and a bad guy? Their hats, that's right. White hat represented a good guy. Black hat represented a bad guy. It's pretty simple, pretty simple. Well, in real life, it's not so easy to tell the good guys from the bad guys. While we like to hope that everyone is a good guy, we know that that's not the case in the world. And the truth is, if um, the, the truth be known, all of us, even the strongest believers, have a little bit of bad guy still in us. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus says that there is good guys and bad guys in the kingdom. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Turn in your Bibles to the parable of the weeds, Matthew chapter 13. We're still in Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to look at verse 24 through 30, which is the parable itself, and then 36 through 4 to 3, which is the explanation of the parable. By the way, if you don't have a Bible today, we're going to have most of our important scriptures on the screens, and they're also in the listening guide. And we also have Bibles in the seat backs there in front of you, down in the trays below. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, that is our gift to you today. So take that home if you would like to. So I'm going to turn in my Bible here, my little pulpit Bible. Not so little anymore because I need the big letters. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, we'll begin with just looking at verses 24, 25, and 26. This is called the parable of the weeds. Jesus told them another parable, and he's talking to the crowd. He's talking to the multitudes here, and he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. So we'll pause there and we'll continue in a moment. The Word of God is so rich and so blessed that we could, we could explore many truths and principles uh, from the Scriptures. In fact, I have five kingdom principles for you today with your listening guide but first, I want to get to our main idea, the most important personal application as we read this parable is this. It is imperative that I know if I am a wheat or a weed. It is imperative. It is, it is critical. The most important thing, like many of these parables talking about the kingdom, is to identify if I am a stalk of wheat or a weed. Like many of the parables, this is the setting which was common to the region at that time around Israel. And he uses this setting to draw in the listeners. Remember, a parable is a story alongside a spiritual point. And so he says, <coughs> excuse me, a man sowed good seed in his, in his field. And of course it's good seed. Which farmer sows bad seed, right? But that's important. We'll come back to that in a moment. Jesus explains that in a moment. But of course it's good seed. But we also know that it takes more than just good seed for a farmer to produce a healthy crop. It takes good weather. Uh, we, the farmer has to fight off insects and environments and pestilence. Lots of things can happen to hinder a good crop. And in this case, something really unusual happens. While his workers, or his servants are sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among 
the wheat. Now, usually farmers don't have enemies per se. In fact, in the part of the country where I grew up, farmers tended to work together because it was for their benefit, for their production, and for their profitability. And if they knew that a a rainstorm was coming or their flood was coming, sometimes they would come and help their neighbor out to harvest before that happened so that they would have a good harvest. But here, there's a bad neighbor, right? And so you think about farming and you have to fight drought. You have to fight pestilence. I was thinking about uh, uh, Lindsay's dad and he has a little garden every year. And like I talked about a few weeks ago, these gorgeous big tomatoes and green beans and radishes and, and, and onions and, and all these great, uh, great homegrown vegetables that are, that are just fantastic, you know. But one of the things my, my, uh, my father-in-law does is he gets uh, a little overzealous when it comes to uh, vermin control. Uh, and I remember one instance where uh, Lindsay and I were staying the 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 night there with our girls. We came down for a morning coffee, and there's there's good old Ken and his PJs out there fighting off the garments with a pellet gun. You know, I think I got one. I think I got one. Now, that really doesn't have anything to do with the parable. I was just Sonny. I'm sorry. I was just telling a story. It's a good story, but usually we don't have enemies right? That's so bad seed, that's so weeds among your wheat. And so when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. The weeds appeared also. Here's your kingdom principle number one on your listening guide. You can fill this in. Both good and bad people exist simultaneously in the kingdom of the world, in the, king, in the world, both wheat and weeds. This is a pretty unpopular delineation nowadays. In our postmodern world, people, some, some people don't like to talk about good and bad, right and wrong. How dare you judge like that? But Jesus definitively says there's good, there's bad, there's children of righteousness, children of God, there's children of the devil or of the world, and that's the case here. And if these weeds were what most interpreters believe, it would have been very hard at this stage of growth to determine which were weeds and which were wheat. I won't bore you with the details, but they look very similar at this stage. And I remember as a little boy really frustrating my mother because I thought I was helping her weed her little her, her flower garden. But because the petals weren't developed enough yet, I couldn't tell the difference. Anybody ever did that? Everybody, anybody ever pull out something you later regretted? Yeah. Anybody left something in your flower bed thinking, I think that's a flower, and then later it was a weed? Yeah, we, we, sometimes we have trouble judging between the, the wheat and the weeds in this case. But in the same bed were weeds and flowers, and I blew it. Um, well, in the same way, good and bad exist simultaneously in the world. And also, I think, within uh, the broad expanse of the name of Christianity, okay? Uh, within those who would call themselves Christians, uh, we would say that there are those who say they are Christians but are not true Christians. Um, and I think the larger the community, the more chance there is of that. And I'm not saying that there's a Judas Iscariot in every Bible study or small group. Not every church has a group of Pharisees. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that we should go on witch hunts here. But the reality of the kingdom is that not all who claim to follow Christ truly are believing disciples. And one purpose of this parable is to encourage individual reflection and analysis to carefully consider and evaluate what kind of plant I am, what kind of plant you are. 
And so the parable continues in verse 27 and 28 here. Let me find it again. Okay, so Jesus said, The owner's servants, the farmhands, if you will, came to him, the owner, and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? Verse 28, very important. An enemy did this, he replied. And I can't help but think in my house sometimes, the, the remote control goes missing. <laughs> Somebody hid the remote control. Somebody stole it. Well, it's usually in the seat cushion, but uh, sometimes I get a little paranoid with the remote control. I'm one of those. I admit it. But in this case, it's true. An enemy, there's no paranoia here. The enemy did do it. The servants asked them, well, do you want us to go and pull the weeds up then? No, he said. We'll get back to that in a moment. But the landowner has seen this before. He's not fooled. He knows what's going on. Going on. An enemy has sabotaged his crop. Here's your kingdom principle number two. God is not fooled by weeds among the wheat. God is not fooled by weeds among the wheat. You know, we can put on our masks and we can act Christian and we can say Christian words and we can fool a lot of people, but God knows our hearts. I think about a, a colleague back in Missouri, Pastor Jack and a little country church, good man, good pastor. I think he's been there for 30 years or so. And uh, a few years ago, his church burned down. And come to find out, it was not accidental. It was because uh, the lead deacon and the treasurer was concealing evidence that he had stolen for 15 years, uh, embezzled money from the church. In fact, it was about $300,000 that uh, little country church doesn't have a lot of money. And the good news is, through legal matters and everything, all was discovered, so you reap what you sow. And um, he was uh, incarcerated, and they got a new church with insurance, but it was a struggle for a long time. But I think about, he deceived a lot of people about being this man of God. And I say that not again so that we go on witch hunts, but just to keep us grounded in reality. We don't want to see that in one another. We want to look for the good in others, but we re recognize that there is weeds among the wheat. And if you haven't caught on, the landowner is Jesus, and he's not surprised by the weeds among the wheat. And he knows who's behind this subterfuge. He's not dismayed and alarmed. It's his crop. He's ultimately in charge of the harvest, and he knows how to deal with this. But his servants ask, well, should we pull up the weeds? You know, back in that day, they didn't have Roundup, and uh, they didn't have ambulance chasers and TV commercials about getting reimbursed. Um, you may be entitled to reimbursement for Roundup. I guess it's not really something to joke about, but... Um, they had to pull up the weeds. They say, should we pull up the weeds? Verse 29, he says, no, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Bring it into my barn. There's the master's plan. No, let them both grow together. Again, good and bad exist simultaneously in the world, in God's kingdom. And the master concludes, don't worry about it. I'm in control. It's no big deal. Let them grow. Uh, let them grow. Time will tell which is which, right? And Jesus said elsewhere, you reap what you sow. And Paul quotes that as well. I think it was one of my favorite preachers, Charles Stanley, that says, you reap what you sow, 
later than you sow, more than you sow. Just think about that, ponder that for a moment, right? If you sow good works and good habits and good deeds, you're going to experience blessing by and large. But if you sin, your sin will find you out. There will be a harvest. That's, that detail is coming. But I think about this. Jesus says, no, don't pull up the weeds. And we need to be careful. Sometimes we think that it is our responsibility to identify and uproot the weeds in the church. Where are the pastors can get caught in this trap, right? I think about <clears throat> so-called ministries today on social media and blogs and, and, and Facebook and YouTube of these characters that feel like it is their God-given right and to, to expose all the, the, the charlatans in ministry. And yes, we do need to be careful that there is a lot of false teaching out there. And if there is a case in, in the local body, the leadership does need to be careful about doctrine and beliefs and identifying those good teachings from bad. But Jesus says, by and large, we don't need to go on witch hunts. He's in control of the harvest. We are responsible for keeping each other accountable in our relationships and in our small groups and our accountability sessions, but we're not the harvesters. That leads us to kingdom principle number three, a separation is coming. Church, a separation is coming. What we call judgment day, a day of judgment. And I'm not going to expand in this and to go in great detail, you would need to uh, attend Brother Lyle's uh, class in Revelation. But for many modern ears, this idea of God's judgment is primitive, it's silly, it's unenlightened, it's unmodern. But Jesus says there is a day of reckoning, as we would say. A day of separation, a day of separation of wheat and weeds, sheep from goats, good fish from bad fish are the analogies that he uses. So as citizens of the kingdom of God, we must trust God. It's really tempting to want to vindicate ourselves when we feel like we've been wronged. It's really tempting to go and try to weed out the weeds that we see, uh, that we think are bad. But what's the problem with that? We, always, we don't know. We don't have perfect judgment like God. And yes, we can tell a good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. But we don't have perfect judgment. So we need to leave the judging, for the most part, up to God. It's our responsibility to assess our own faith and to challenge others to do the same. So we skip down to the parable in verse 36, the parable explanation, rather, in verse 36, Jesus gives a couple other parables that we covered two weeks ago. And we get down to the explanation. It's basically small group time. Verse 36 says, Then he left the crowd and went into the house. See, he taught the parables publicly, but often he pulled his disciples aside privately. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. We don't get it. We need a little bit further details. And so he does. And I think about how uh, you can learn a lot from a large group setting like this with good teaching, good preaching. Uh, but if you want to really dive deep into the word of God and have greater understanding of God's kingdom, you need the one on one interaction of a small group setting, a small group Bible study. That's where you really dive into the meat. We offer so many of those here. But uh, it's small group time, and he says, verse 37, here's the explanation, verses 37 through 39. Jesus explains, he answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The son of man is a title that Jesus used of himself uh, it was one way that he uh, both identified with mankind, but also claimed his deity. It's a title from 
the book of Daniel. It was an exalted title in the Old Testament. And he says, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, Jesus. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Now, most of the time when we look at parables, especially the short parables, they have one main point. But sometimes it's a longer extended parable, and there needs further explanation. And Jesus gives this analogy in depth. So let's look at what's what here. First, we have the sower, like I said, also known as the master, the, the landowner, the son of man, that is Jesus. That is Jesus himself. And the field is the world. The field is the world. Most important for us today are the wheat and the weeds. I could go into great detail on the sower and the field and the harvesters and all of that. But for, for us today, the wheat or the grain, the good seed, uh, sons of the kingdom, the righteous, these are all synonym for believers, true believers, genuine followers of Christ who've been born again. They have Christ's righteousness applied to them by faith through his grace, and they're becoming more righteous. They're true believers. What are the weeds? Also identified as sons of the evil one. The sin causers are lawbreakers. They're synonyms for unbelievers. The wicked in the world who disbelieve and live their lives as if God does not exist. The enemy is the evil one, the devil, the adversary, Satan. The harvest is judgment day. And the reapers are God's angels. Now let's look at verse 40 through 43. We'll wrap this up so we can take the Lord's Supper. Jesus says, As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out of His kingdom, out of the world, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will be... They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Well, small group time just got really real really quick. Kingdom principle number four, weeds will be definitively, irrevocably uprooted. Weeds will be uprooted. On the day of judgment, Jesus will send forth his angels and they will gather all the wicked who do not believe. And they will be thrown into the blazing furnace, obviously a reference to hell where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you know I like to laugh and I love to tell jokes and be funny and have joy but there are points in the scripture where it's very serious and very sober. And this is one of those things. One of the things I don't joke about is damnation. And that is the case here. This imagery, again, is unpalatable to our modern ears. But we must not soften it. Jesus talked about these things as much or more than he did about heaven. And this verse is no less true than John 3.16. So we must hear it and apply it. Everything that causes sin and all who do evil will be definitively, if irrevocably uprooted and judged. That is sober, sober stuff. But what about the wheat? What about the wheat? This is the good stuff. Kingdom principle number five, wheat will be eternally rewarded. We saw in the parable that it is harvested and it is secured and safely stored in the barn. But I particularly noticed the language of adoption in verse 43. 
the language of sons and daughters of the kingdom. It's their father's kingdom. It's our father's kingdom. And if your father is the king, that makes you and I what? Princes and princesses in the kingdom. What a wonderful thought that is. And notice that we will shine like the sun. I think that means public vindication and glory. By faith, we believe with the day of separation, the judgment that all will be set right, that was wrong. All the wrong will be identified and judged, and it is good for the, to be so. We all have that revolting in our hearts when we see an obvious criminal get released and set free when we know that there was injustice done. But the right will also be revealed and vindicated. There will be a great day of reckoning. Jesus concludes the explanation with a specific solemn calling that he often said, Hear, uh, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Listen up. This is really important. Listen. Listen up. And so how do we apply these today? with our shortened service for the Lord's Supper, which is very, very important, I, I just boiled it down to evaluating ourselves. You can't read a parable like this. Put yourself in the mind, uh, put yourself in the audience in Jesus' day and hear what he has to, to say. What, does, what is the main application? Well, for me, even as a pastor, a person who's been in the church my whole life, I'm always taken aback and step back and want to evaluate my life and my faith. This helps us evaluate. That's a good thing. So I've given us some questions that can help us determine if we're a stalk of wheat in the field of the kingdom or if we're a weed. So we're going to ask and answer some questions in your listening guide. And I want you to know, you may occasionally see me walking around with a clipboard. That's because I like clipboards. Um, I don't have a spiritual clipboard, a spiritual naughty and nice list where I go around and evaluate, ooh, that's a weed. I know that's a weed. I know, oh, he's a weed. He's a weed. She's definitely a weed. Him over there, no, nah, that's a weed. I don't do that. That's not what I'm talking about. We don't need to go on spiritual uh, witch hunts. This is for self-evaluation, okay? And like I, I've said before, I've experienced enough to know that we can sometimes fool each other, but we can't fool God. Sad thing is, we can sometimes fool ourselves. So these are some good questions that I ask myself periodically to make sure that I'm wheat. Question number one, if you have the courage to answer these, do I have a concern for the things of God? Or do I display apathy toward the things of God? Worship, prayer, devotional times, reading the Bible, assembly with God's people, sharing of faith, those kind of things. Generally speaking, do I have a concern and value those things? Or are they, eh, I don't care about them. Question number two. Do I have conviction about the sin and wrongdoing in my life? Or do I display an indifference to the sin in my life? When I do something or say something wrong, am I convicted about it? Does it bother me until I confess it to God and, and get it right? Or am I indifferent to it? Or even worse, do I celebrate it? Another good question to ask, do I have a love for the people of God or do they annoy me? <laughs> we kind of laugh about that. Everybody gets annoyed every once in a while. We're, we are a family and brothers and sisters get annoyed with each other. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking by and large, do I love to spend time with fellow believers? I'm not saying you don't have unsaved and uh, unbelieving friends. That's good too. But do I, do I love the body of Christ? Or do they really get on my nerves? Those goody two-shoes Christians. That's a good way to assess. 
One more, am I experiencing a change in my life? Am I having more success in, in my fight against the sin in my life? Or am I just as bad or even worse than I ever used to be? You know, the testimonies, the dramatic testimonies, always get the, the greatest attention. And I'm not saying there has to be an immediate drastic change. I'm not, but over time, you know, people should look at us and say, you're different than you used to be in high school. You're changed. You're not the jerk or you're not, the, you're not that person you used to be. You, you're different. And I want to know why that is. That should be a characteristic of our lives. Now, I also want to caution because I've found most of the time the people who worry most about their salvation, who are most sensitive about this, are that way because they truly are saved. It's the people who have no concern at all for salvation that I worry about. If this is a concern of you, that in itself is evidence that you're one of God's people. So I don't do that to cast doubt or to make you paranoid, but it's just a good, healthy thing to evaluate yourself. I just want to give a moment of sharing of my faith so that as we approach the altar, it's not literally an altar, but as we approach the Lord's Supper table today, uh, that those who may be listening online or those who are here today have an opportunity. If they have realized that their salvation is in doubt, that they can take a step to correct that. So let me just give you a very short and simple gospel presentation. Um, God is good and holy and perfect, and we're not. We all blow it. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And we truly don't understand how offensive that sin is to God. That sin causes a separation. He is so pure and holy and righteous that no ounce of wickedness or evil can be in his presence for eternity. And that is called our sin problem. Our sin separates us from God. And if we die in that condition, we will spend eternity separated from God in this existence of hell that Jesus just talked about. And so that is a, our main problem. The most important issue that we ever have to deal with in our life is this sin issue. The good news is, is that Jesus took care of it for us. God sent Jesus to die on the cross for us so that we could be forgiven of our sin. He paid our punishment so that we don't have to pay that punishment forever. He took his precious and holy body and blood and poured it out on the cross so that we could be forgiven. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But that truth does not apply to everyone just by in and of itself. You have to believe it. You have to put faith in it. You have to trust in it. You have to look at Jesus and what he did and you have to believe that he truly did it and that he did it for you, and that it's valuable for you. And you can apply that belief through repentance and faith, the double-sided coin of salvation. It's when we look to Christ and put faith in him, asking him to forgive us and surrendering our life to him, that he comes in and he makes us a citizen of his kingdom, a child in his kingdom. He, he, makes a, he adopts us into his eternal family, and we are saved and sealed for all eternity. And if you are desiring to do that today, and you recognize that you've never done that, and that's something you want to surrender to, I just invite you to pray along with me. There's nothing magical about this prayer. It is just you getting honest with God about your sin and about who Jesus is and, and surrendering your life to him. And I'm just going to lead us through this time of prayer. And if you're ready to do that, follow along with me. You could do this on your own, in your own words. But I just say something like this. Dear Heavenly Father, in your heart, you don't have to say it out loud. He knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. Dear Father in heaven, I recognize today that I am a sinner. 
I've done wrong, I've said wrong, I've hurt others, and that this sin offends you because you're holy. And I recognize that I need to be forgiven and that I want to be forgiven. And so I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I want to be a child of the kingdom. I want to be part of your body. I I want to be saved. I want to experience that life change. So come into my heart and life and make me new. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe he rose from the dead. I don't understand everything, but who does? But I believe those things, and now I just want to surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And I believe that if you sincerely, truly prayed that and meant it, nobody goes to hell because Jesus rejected them, because Jesus does not reject anybody. The reason he came was that so that we could be saved. What a glorious thing that is. And if that is you today, you can also participate in the Lord's Supper with us. We're drawing to the time of the Lord's Supper where we... Focus on what he did for us. And at First Baptist Church, you do not have to be a member, a formal member of our church to take the Lord's Supper. But this is a special service, a ceremony, if you will, that is best reserved for believers and and those who have made a public profession of faith and, and do claim Christ as their own. It's important to me as your pastor to make sure that we don't rush through this portion of the service. I know what time it is, and we have plenty of time. It's time to think about the cross. And one of the ways that I've always done that historically, my grandma grew up and uh, helped raise me in the church. And I've mentioned this before, but some of you may have not have heard it. She always reminded me, she said, Justin, if you ever get distracted during the Lord's Supper, Take your, take your thumb, your thumbnail, and dig it into your hand and just put a little pressure into your hand and that will remind you of the cross. And so I do that sometimes because even I get distracted, right? So it is a time of communion. Protestants have labeled this time communion because it is a time we commune with or uh, we, we enter into God's presence in a special way and have fellowship with him at this table. It's a good time for personal examination, confession, meditation upon the cross, and trust in the scriptures that promise forgiveness. Therefore, I'm going to prepare the table in just a moment, but I'm going to ask you to take a spend some time in silent reflection and prayer. Think about this. 1 John 1, 7 through 9 from the New Living Translation says, But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim to have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And so I'm going to invite our servers to come as we prepare the table. Won't you spend some time with the Lord this morning? And Joy's going to play some beautiful music for us to meditate upon the cross. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
For as often as you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this service that reminds us of the cross. Thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we have the forgiveness of sins. Bless his holy name. In his name we pray, amen. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And the psalmist says, For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. As we sang this morning, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Praise the Lord.